So I, I'm, I'm happy to introduce Mike Stolte. I met Mike uh, last year when, when I was doing an interview about Kaylin. And it was an interview that turned into a, a, a really personal and powerful conversation. It was quite a time. Oh, I could I could even tell a story about the probe. <laughs> Yes, I do. I'm, are you telling it? No. no okay. <laughs> okay. We we were outside Kaylin Hospice under under a spruce tree. We we're having this powerful conversation about grief and 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 and, and sorrowful things. And and a crow came and landed in the tree immediately over our heads, looking right at us and started scolding us. I was recording. I was trying to record it, and I had to shut the recording off. It was just. It was the most awesome thing. <laughs> it, it really felt like a, a, an omen or a, a sign. It was just amazing. <laughs> but, but I had a great time, and I know Mike uh, has really uh, uh, thought deeply about uh, grief and, and, and gratitude. And I, he, he did a great interview, and I, I thought, I thought it would be great to bring you here, Mike, to talk about this with us today. So, very happy to welcome you to Nelson Union Unitarian Spiritual Center and give us your talk. So thanks for coming, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, and, and just the sort of the other part of the story was um, Fiona's animal totem was Raven and Crow, and not long after she died, she had two tattoos um, that she got two weeks before the cancer returned, and it was, and I was like, I never wanted mar my body with a tattoo and I was inspired by her and I went out and got a raven tattoo so this raven <laughs> up above the tree was scolding us while we were doing the interview and I just thought Fiona's just playing little tricks she was this Irish elf that just liked to do things like that this little sprightly fairy so um, that was the other side of that and two and as as it um, just so happens I let the dog out this morning and there were two ravens sitting in the tree and they were scolding me this morning, as I, just before I came here. And uh, Fiona works in mysterious ways. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying, um, I think we live in a very cynical age. Does everyone, does anybody disagree with that? <laughs> I, and I think cynicism is the new black. And I honestly think that it's really hard not to become cynical. It's almost like. I've been thinking about it over the last two or three weeks. It's almost like a poison that seeps in and creeps in. And my, 21, my very wise 21-year-old son said, it's easy to be cynical because you're never wrong. You can always stay sort of darker than everyone else. That way you're not vulnerable. And I think we live in an age where people don't want to be vulnerable. And I, I sort of want to question that today and sort of challenge you not to get rooted in the cynicism because it becomes this poison that affects our life. And Fiona was this antidote to cynicism. She was this, it's hard to describe. Those of you that have been lucky enough to have had a sort of a soul friend or a soul mate, and someone that just lights up the room um, are, can maybe relate a little bit to this. I know we've all had friends and loved ones who we've lost or we've either through friend, Friendships have ended, or relationships have ended, or we've lost them uh, in this realm. And um, I wanted to share my story today about, it's first going to be, it's sort of in three parts. It's Grace, where I'm going to talk about Fiona, introduce you to her. A very wise friend of mine named Morag um, said to me once, you only grieve because you really love. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal journey with grief, and then my practice of gratitude, which I've tried to, I've really tried to, use it to temper my cynicism. I grew up in a very cynical family, sort of everyone was quick to cut and quick to criticize. You know, sort of it's the university education thing. Um, and I just want to make sure that I don't fall into that trap. So I'm going to start this, I'm going to start with a two minute video that Fiona and I did after our first, through our first chemo. And it's just, uh, it's called Tears Are For Crybabies. And it gives you hopefully the sound Fiona hated technology, so the chances are this thing will not work, but uh, let's see if it does. <laughs>
I haven't mentioned how much I've cried. I think I've cried more in the last 18 weeks than... <laughs> I just want to honor what I would call sacred tears. And it's something that in our society we tend to hide away and regard as a sign of weakness, and it's not. It's a thing of beauty. And tears are, for one, it's another outlet to let the chemotherapy drugs come out of my system. For two, it shows absolute reverence for really important pieces of ourselves and pieces of our life experience. And so I just, I really appreciate my own ability to cry with the few people that I can trust to cry with and also I will cry by myself and I don't regard it as weakness I regard it as cleansing and healthy and I think uh, that's not a message we hear very often so let's all be cry babies <laughs> see um, or you can hear her Irish accents and uh, you get a sense of the beautiful person that Fiona was just in that snippet. We did a series of um, seven videos after her first or just at the end of her first chemo and uh, I just want to share with you a little bit about Fiona so you understand her and this photo was taken up at Coconut Creek. We went looking for the Dippers. I don't know if you have seen the American Dipper, but that was my nickname for her, Sergey Dipper. Um, we started texting each other in Russian not long after we started seeing each other, and we never stopped. Even though we don't speak Russian, it's kind of pigeon Russian. Um, and she loved going up and watching Dippers in the stream, because what they would do is they'd dip, dip, dip with these fat little birds that, that dip into the chaos, the turbulent waters, and they pull nourishment from the turbulence. And she named her business um, basically uh, in the stream consulting because she felt that she could bring clarity by people by dipping into the turbulence. And she became a health crisis coach after her first um, chemo episode because she really felt she could help people uh, work through it. So what is grace? Grace is simple elegance and refinement of movement. And I found this this morning. She moved through the water with effortless grace. And this was Fiona. Um, for those of you that know her, I know Jacqueline said she was in Panto with her. She, she had this easefulness about her. And she didn't think of herself as elegant. She thought of herself as kind of a clod. But she just moved with this, with this grace. And I wanted to share a little bit about her. Uh, she grew up in Northern Ireland. We could talk till the cows come home. And the cows did live just about 20 meters from her house. Uh, this is in a lane. Uh, just sort of meters from where she grew up. Uh, about three and a half years ago, we bought the Blue Spruce just off the street because we had four teenagers. Uh, one of them happens to be here today, my daughter Katie. And uh, we inherited with the Blue Spruce a number of keys. And what, one thing that was really important to us was taking our sixum, we basically decided we'd have our four kids one week and then we'd have no kids the next week. And it was kind of this we really tried to create this sense of a six sum. So here we were out at um, Tagum throwing uh, rocks on the ice. That was one of our little outings. Here we were out in Harrop Proctor doing some sort of a walk. You can see the grumbling kids. And this one, on a Sunday night, we decided to go up and have a Nerf fight um, up at Gyro Park in the dark, uh, going up through the park, which was probably pretty treacherous and ill-advised. <laughs> Uh, this is Fiona in northern Scotland, um, trekking with her brother. She found solace in the mountains and kind of loved being outdoors. And this is her at her favorite beach in County Donegal in Ireland, a um, beach called Sesha, um, which I 
A third of her ashes were scattered here. I took a third to the Redwoods in California, and a third of them were scattered in the Kokanee Creek, and with her two kids, Mahalia and Teo. This is, um, this is, you get a sort of sense of the, uh, the life of Fiona. She just had this energy that was almost indescribable and uncontainable. Um, and this, uh, my son did a little caricature of us, he called us dorks. Um, <laughs> and this is her with her son, Teo, and just sort of the, you know, tears of joy. There were so many amazing moments. Um, putting duct tape on our um, VW camper van. It was called um, the first. Her first camper van was Jean Claude Van Damme van, <laughs> and then this one was Millie Vanilli. Um, and uh, whenever we had a chance, we'd get away and escape in the camper van or travel somewhere. As I said, um, the universe has a funny sense of humor, and about a week before. Fiona was diagnosed with cancer, um, or re-diagnosed. She got ta two tattoos. One was a Piscean fish. She was very, as I said, sort of this elegant, watery, fluid woman. And she got a heart, a Celtic heart, over her, um, the dome port where the chemo had gone in. And um, as I said, like I never would have considered getting a tattoo, but I was quite inspired by her afterwards. And sort of, she. <laughs> She always had a sense of fun. There's Teo about to fire two Nerf bullets into her head. Um, as I said, she really used her stories as a way to make herself a better person. And so the, after the first chemo, she went and this is in Teo's class, and she was talking about how every kid could be a superhero because kids these days are so bombarded by images, and, and someone was saying it the other day that so many kids are anxious and depressed, and I think one of the one of the reasons is they see so many images on social media of everyone doing s something spectacular. And as my son, my wise twenty-one-year-old son said, everyone that's everyone's a role, and they take thirty takes to do it, and that's what kids compare themselves to do to, and it's very difficult. So Fiona did this motivational thing. We did a leadership class with kids at um, at uh, Wildflower. Her kid was. In and she was a very competitive Bananagram player. Don't know if any of you have played Bananagrams, but she was vicious and um, ruthless. And she used Welsh, Irish, Scottish, <laughs> and a few other words that I questioned because we didn't use a traditional Scrabble dictionary. So you, there you can see, um, this is a text we sent back and forth. You may not be able to read it, but this was in her Pigeon lo uh, Russian. This is when her sister arrived during her chemo. Um, but the last thing says, you are big, ridiculous, techno Greek, techno geek, idiot, um, and XOXO, kiki kiki. That was kind of our kiss, kisses, and hugs. So um, she could even make trail look good. That was a, a picture <laughs> taken down in trail. And this was interesting enough. Um, I was going through photos this morning, and this was uh, taken uh, just as the moment she started coughing. And uh, this was, she thought she had pneumonia, and as it turned out, cancer had metastasized to her lungs. Um, trying to buy an Ikea kitchen in Calgary, um, being 80s rock stars, cooking a beautiful dinner at our, our house just up the street in a purple sequin dress, like who does that? And then I'll, I'll leave you with this. This is our six of them up doing a hike, um, and our kids, and again, this was, the day I think she started to feel winded in her lungs, and um, so I've got this picture still over our fireplace. So that's a little bit of Fiona, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about grief now. Um, I think you all know what grief is. Um, is anyone in this room that hasn't experienced grief? And um, I want to share a couple things um, Morag shared with me, and Morag was instrumental. I, I, I just want to point out part of my story my four biggest fears about two and a half years ago were that the cancer would come back, it would be a slow, painful death, that I would lose Fiona, and that I'd lose our sixth son. And all four of those came true. Um, her kids moved in with their dad 
Um, I lost my son to university. My daughter was in hospital in Vancouver for eight months with an eating disorder, and Katie gave me permission to say that. Um, Katie couldn't even come for the memorial, so this, in effect, is kind of a, a little bit of a memorial. Not only that, but there was a falling out with her family that had come to help in the last few weeks. Um, there was a rocky goodbye. We didn't really have that goodbye that we wanted. And um, there were oxygen containers, a hospital bed in our, in our living room. There were drugs in the house. The house was a mess. I was a mess. Um, and um, I was overwhelmed. And I'm thankful to say that I had heart friends that I could kind of go and talk to. I had grief support. Um, Morag and a couple other people at MBHS were incredible in terms of um, being able to allow me to tell my story on a, a weekly basis and tell it over and over again until I had these doubts and this guilt around whether or not Fiona had truly loved me. And um, even though I, I knew she adored me, I had this thing because we hadn't resolved some issues at the end. And uh, I was exhausted. And when you're exhausted, you have no time to really comprehend anything or to really be in yourself. Um, it took me 40 days to go out for a coffee at Oso Negro. I had been there, you know, that was my kind of haunt. It took me six months to go out for a beer with my friends. But I also wanted to lean into it. Um, some of my friends had said, this is an opportunity. Um, and I had read a book called Broken Open by um, a beautiful author named Elizabeth Lesser, who talked about sort of the, the amazing opportunities at death and uh, birth and other sort of big events in life can pose. And so I, I went to the Michael Franti concert alone, even though my friends had sort of said, let's, let's take you up there. You, you don't want to be alone. And we had been huge Michael Franti fans. So I went up to Caswell on my own. And I felt so sad. I was there dancing at the back. And I kind of got jostled to the back of the, everyone. And before I knew it, Fiona and I had been in Spokane the year before, and we had, she elbowed her way up to the mosh pit. And we were dancing just, you know, and she, she was incredible for that. And so I was so sad because I, I was missing Fiona. And we had two special songs that Michael Franti, and I, I, they're hugely spiritual. It's almost, um, and all of a sudden Michael Franti's stage popped in front of us, like this portable stage, and he started playing on stage right in front of me. And this, I was way back. And then, he waved me up on stage, and and then so I danced with him, and I'm in the Caslow Jazz Festival video three times, dancing with Michael Franti on stage, <laughs> and I'm, I was thinking that was Fiona, she was she was working. Um, two other things that I just wanted to mention: I really wanted to lean into my grief. Um, I did not want to avoid it. Um, I went down to the redwoods by myself. We had done this trip in our camper van the year before along the Oregon coast down to the redwoods saw this beautiful grove of trees, five of the 10 biggest trees in the world, that aren't even on any maps. They're called the Grove of the Titans. Um, it had been a special place for us, so I went down and scattered the ashes there, and I did the same trip by myself, and that was one of the hardest things I did. And then I went to Ireland, and I wasn't sure what kind of a reception I would get from her family, and um, I also went to Spain, when I was over there, it was really important because we had said as the kids grew up, we wanted to spend some time in Spain. She really liked the idea of trekking and um, going on the, um, doing the Pyrenees. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, I, 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 a couple things about grief um, that Morgan reminded me of last week was that it feels like you've got no skin. It really does. And it feels like, you know when someone, if I hit, well, I better not hit Monica there, because I know she's not got a great leg. But um, if I touch Keith like this on the leg, it doesn't hurt. But when you've got a broken leg and someone does that to you, it's not, it really hurts. And that's what it feels like. Everything is amplified during grief. And I wrote down a few things. I was in an Irish pub. I was so alone. I felt so alone in Ireland. Like I traveled around by myself. I just wanted to share some of these, because and I'm sure some of you experienced this, feeling like it's winter, spring, summer, and fall all at the same time, teetering between sadness and giddiness and not knowing why, feeling so lonely but not really wanting to be with anyone because no one really gets it, being angry because the world doesn't stop, being angry because you feel as if the ripple of your loved one will disappear into silence, wanting to tell everyone but no one, feeling desperately empty, realizing you're not in control of your emotions, 
not being able to engage in small talk, or if you do, feeling the emptiness and soullessness of it. And feeling like a pariah, like a going to save on and, or um, a store, and people would turn around because they didn't know what to say to you, and it felt, it just, it amplified my, my sense of loneliness. Um, so this is, I just want to talk for a few minutes now about a practice that I've, I've um, tried to incorporate into my life that I think has really helped me on this grief journey. Uh, not long after Fiona's first cancer, I was starting to become very dark in the way that I was thinking about things, so I started a gratitude journal. And I should point out that I had started a gratitude journal a few points in my life that I couldn't think of. One, one day, not long after my marriage split up, I couldn't think of one thing to put in my gratitude journal. So I said, I'm going to commit to this gratitude journal. Um, and I tried to put, have a, an entry every day with a photograph. And so this was, this was within, this was in uh, about three months of, I make it, this was in three months of Fiona's chemo ending the first time. So I started Gratitude Journal, and it's, there's an app on iPhone called Gratitude 365. And so every day you can put in an entry. So when Fiona's cancer came back, I tried to do 10 a day. It was like, I need to keep on the positive side of things. At Christmas, two months later, I tried to do 20 gratitudes a day, and I was able to do it, even though the cancer was progressing. There was a seven months be, be, between when it was diagnosed, re-diagnosed, and when she passed away. And then last summer, after she had passed away, I noticed that I was doing it rather than meditating. I found this practice. I'd get up in the morning, and I'd, when I get up in the morning, I'm pretty, I can be pretty negative. I need my coffee. I try to read nourishing stuff. Um, I, I could only read poetry for the first number of months. And I try and, like I read, I try and read Rilke, I try and read a guy named Mark Nepo, I try and read a few other people who really I can relate to. And I realized I was doing 50 gratitudes a day. And so I tried to say, I, I'm gonna do 30 days of 50 gratitudes a day, which requires you to sit down several times during the day, be very conscious about it. So at, at uh, December 31st, I hit 500 days of 50 gratitudes a day, and it's a practice that I think has really helped me kind of remain positive through everything. And it's not so much remaining positive, because I don't want to be a positive Pollyanna, but I think it's, it's been incredibly important for me um, in terms of just probably keeping me sane and really helping me to rewire so that I, I, I tried to be the person that I want to be for my kids. And now my daughter is doing the gratitude journal. And it's from being in the hospital and not wanting even to be, she didn't want to be alive two years ago, to being in a place right now where she's meditating, she's doing mindfulness practice, she's doing all sorts of neat things. And part of it has been she's adopted this um, attitude of gratitude. So this is a little bit about just something, I mean, you can do it on paper, you can do it any sort of way, but um, you know, I, 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 a good cup of coffee, a good sleep, a rich conversation, great food, a ripe avocado, a good smoothie. Um, it's, it's interesting how few times TV or technology comes up in terms of my gratitude. <laughs> uh, it's, really, it's really quite interesting. Um, and then just this is from February two years ago. These are some of the photographs I have. This is Fiona and her sister Hills, who came over from England. Uh, this was some of the nice food we were provided. People were dropping off food, and it was so appreciated. It was so necessary. And this is a. My daughter was in this really dark period at BGH in this eating disorder unit, and she texted me this. And actually, this was at Trail Hospital because they took away the phones in the eating disorder unit, but. Um, it's, it meant so much to me, and it was my way of being able to kind of save it like a little scrapbook. Um, Fiona and I were still able, despite her cancer being in her lungs, walk along the mountain station trail, and um, my friend Lynn Betts making scones for us. Um, and some days we just go to bed and watch crap. <laughs> um, Food Network Star, or something like that, and then being below the disco ball. And then just being able to snuggle. And, and it's interesting, one of the things that I, Fiona used to talk years ago about, I, I wrote for a couple of years as the Happy Economist, and uh, I tried to really get into the economics of happiness. I had been a federal economist at one point in time, but I realized happiness, Fiona said, was made up of all these little snowflake moments. 
these little moments. It wasn't such, and there's this really weird expectation that we're supposed to be happy. And I think that happiness is external, joy is internal. It's being able to sort of be okay with any circumstances. So I, I wanted to share one of these little things. When I, one of the gifts of the gratitude journal, I went back and I was so negative on, we had so many little traumatic things near the end where I was stepping on our toes metaphorically. And there was one time where we just sat in bed and we held pinkies. And I read that, and I kind of say, I'm so lucky to have had that. Um, so I just wanted to kind of conclude. This was last February 23rd, it was her birthday. It was 2.23, February 23rd is 2.23. It was at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in front of Starry Nights. Um, and that was the picture I had on my cell phone at the time of Fiona. It was, we, she always said, if you catch a leaf before it hits the ground, it's, it's, you can make any wish. It's your lucky day. Um, so I kind of wanted to conclude by saying, um, almost by saying, we live in a really cynical age. And I'd like all of you, if you can, to, and I was going to call it the gratitude challenge, but people are like, ah, I don't want to do gratitude, but call it the cynicism challenge. If you can, for the next 30 days, even come up with five things that you're grateful for. And I was going to try and, if we had more time today, I was going to try and do a couple exercises with gratitude, but even five things a day over the next 30 days, and I swear, you'll be a lot less cynical. And I just want to thank you all for um, allowing me to share my story, to share Fiona, and, um, uh, yeah, and Keith for allowing me to come and be in your presence. I feel the warmth and kindness and um, the real heart connection here. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. That's very nice. We'll be here for a few minutes later for coffee. For so sure, if yeah. anybody wants to ask Mike any questions, you can have coffee. So Jack, if you play us a, a little music, we'll pass our, our basket for, for coffee. Yeah, man, why not? Yeah, thanks very much, it was wonderful. <coughs> um,